That was then. This is now. Uh, everyone on your feet, come on, get up on your feet and say the theme verse with me as it comes across the screen. We're going to say it together. Let's do this. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. I hope that will be a verse that you commit to memory. I hope that you live with that verse. Father, I just extend my hands over this congregation to pray that all of us will experience newness regularly in our walk with you. I pray that you just make it fresh today, make it new and alive, that we get the chance to live for you and serve you. And we just give you thanks in the name of Jesus. Amen. Would you fist bump your neighbor and then you can take a seat. The old has gone. The new is here. The old has gone. The, the new has come. Paul was saying that was then. This is now. Today's talk is called That New Christian Smell. That New Christian Smell. Everybody has heard of that new car smell. But what I hope is that every one of you will be able to keep that new Christian smell. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 2.15, we are to God the aroma of Christ for those who are being saved. And so this morning, I'm going to give you a strategy for keeping that new Christian smell. And don't you love new Christians? Yes. I love new Christians. Full of faith, just filled with hope, full of determination. I love that new Christians, you know, they just, they love to read the Bible. They love to pray. They, they never miss church, right? They want people to be saved. They have experienced salvation and they want everyone to experience that. I just love new Christians. And I'm wanting to give you this morning a strategy for keeping that new Christian smell. There was a guy back in the 70s, named Flip Wilson. <laughs> he became famous for saying the words, the devil made me do it. The devil made me do it. And some people, just like Flip, they want to blame the devil for their choices. But that's not reality. Each one of us has, has choices that we make. Each one of us is responsible for our choices and our actions. And we can't blame a mean mom or an absent father yeah. or, you know what, we can't even blame the devil. In the Bible, we don't read about Satan doing wrong things. Rather, we read about him being wrong. He is just wrong. He is evil. Now, we, we do wrong things. We humans, we do wrong things because we have been born with a natural inclination, a bent that is selfish and is away from God and, and it's against God. We're inclined to sin. We are inclined towards sin. And so what do we do? Well, we're so crafty. We blame Satan. We, we say, well, the devil made, we, made me do it, but we know full well the devil didn't make me do it. I am the one who is to blame. I'm the one who made my choices. We are to blame. We, we are the sinners. When humans fall into deep 
dark, ugly sin, I think that sometimes we can tend to think that when that happens, that we hurt God, that God is hurt, and, and that the devil is happy because we've fallen into dark, bad sin. But the truth is, the reality, when we fall into dark, bad sin, probably, probably the devil starts to get nervous because he knows, he knows that we're going to hate him being our ruler. He knows that we're not going to like what he does and we will do anything in our power to throw him off our back. I believe with all of my heart that this message this morning will have eternal implications for many of us in this room. Here's the deal. Here's the deal. You've got to decide what you're going to do with Jesus. You cannot ignore him. You cannot just imagine him away. He won't go away. You've got to make a conscious decision. What will I decide about Jesus? And it has to be more than just a one-time trip to an altar where we kneel and we bow and we say a few words. It can't be a one-time decision. It has to be a lifelong relationship. People picture Jesus in different ways. You know, a lot of people think that when Jesus comes on the scene, He's going to bring peace, to comfort. A lot of us, we imagine Jesus that He's just, He's so happy-go-lucky. He's so at ease. And that's because we have a picture of Jesus as a softy. Some people don't think of Jesus as a real man's man. That Jesus, He's just, he, he's just, uh, you know, he's sort of a, a soft touch. He's so gentle and soothing. And we can imagine that Jesus is sort of like a surfer dude who just goes along with whatever we say. Anything we want, he says, yeah, whatever. But actually, when Jesus comes on the scene, it can be a very disturbing thing. We think it means peace. Sometimes it means chaos. Well, why is that? It's because when Jesus comes into our temple, He starts to overturn the money exchangers' tables. He starts to just wreck the joint because He needs to establish His authority in our hearts. And so when he comes on the scene, it, it can sometimes just turn to chaos. But did you know, sometimes Jesus is not about peace in that moment. Sometimes Jesus will mess you up. Jesus will mess you up. So, the devil didn't make me do it. I did it. You see, I, I can't blame the devil for leading me astray. And I can't blame Jesus for leading me through trials. I can't say, you know, Jesus really dropped the ball. It's not my fault. No, no, no. I can't blame the devil. I can't blame Jesus. The finger points at me. I have been given a wonderful gift. The freedom of choice. What will I choose? Now, if, if you're a Christ follower, the old is gone, the new is here. Hey, this message is all about keeping things new, keeping things pristine, keeping that new Christian smell. This morning, let's read Luke chapter 11. We're going to read 15 verses, not all of them at once, 
but we'll take them in bite-sized pieces as we're moving through Luke chapter 11. And uh, I'll stop and make comments as we're, as we're going ahead. Let, we'll start at verse number 14. It reads this way. Jesus was driving out a demon that was mute. When the demon left, the man who had been mute spoke, and the crowd was amazed. The crowd was amazed. Yeah, I mean, I guess, right? Stop and think about what he just did. Jesus drove out a demon. They were amazed. Now this is one of those places in Scripture where, and there's so many places in the Bible where this happens, but it's very ironic. And there's a, a lot of irony going on right here. Because the Scripture says when God created the heavens and the earth, He spoke them into existence. He spoke it. it his, his crowning achievement, I say it this way, his crowning achievement was when he spoke speakers. Follow me on this. He created creators. He made makers. He developed developers. That's what I mean. That's the idea of when I say he spoke spoke speakers. This had never happened before. And so here's this poor man who is possessed by a demon and he can't speak. No, the demon is opposite everything God stands for. The demon is contra God to the ultimate. He, he is against God in every way. God speaks. The demon is Mute. And Jesus, the living word, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Jesus, the living word, and the word became flesh and it dwelt among us. Jesus, the living word, spoke to this man who was bound by a mute demon. And now the demon leaves, and now he can open his mouth. Now this man can comment on the conversation of life. It's awesome. But some of them said, by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, he is driving out demons. Others tested him by asking for a sign from heaven. Now, depending on which Bible translation you read, it might say Beelzebul, or it might say Beelzebub. So what's going on with that? Well, we're not sure where the name Beelzebul originated. Probably it had to do with Baal worship. In some way, somehow, it was connected to Worship of the pagan god Baal, Baal. And Beelzebub means Lord of the high place. But Beelzebul means Lord of the flies. Now get this, it was a, a sarcastic way for Hebrews to, instead of saying Beelzebub, Lord of, of the high place, they would say Beelzebul, Lord of the flies. And it apparently means, a, you picture flies hovering over a dung heap. Isn't that encouraging? Doesn't that just lift your spirit? But by the time that Jesus comes on the scene, uh, this, this is very clearly a reference to Satan or the devil. When they would say Beelzebul or Beelzebub, they were saying this is demonic. So now get this, some of them said by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, he is driving out demons. He's in cohorts with the demon. That's what's going on. See, that's how he drove him out. They're on the same side. Oh, you, you, you better watch out. This, this is really bad voodoo. 
This guy, Jesus, he's driving out demons. This, this is some really bad magic that he's involved in. See, the demons that he has are more powerful than the guy that had the demons. That's what's going on. And Jesus absolutely dresses down this religious crowd that thinks they've got all the answers. They think they've got it all figured out. And they think that Jesus is, is casting out demons by using demons himself. And verse 17 reads like this. If Jesus knew, uh, it says, Jesus knew their thoughts. And he said to them, any kingdom divided against itself will be ruined. And a house divided against itself will fall. If Satan is divided against himself, how can this kingdom stand? I say this because you claim that I drive out demons by Beelzebub. In other words, how ridiculous. Jesus says, so, so you just think I'm a witch doctor, huh? You think I'm a traveling shaman and I'm I'm using incantations to drive out demons? He, he says, if that were the case, if one demon were driving out another demon, it would be no different than if one general was at battling against another general in his same army. How ridiculous! But then verse 19, Now, if I drive out demons by Beelzebub, whom do your followers drive them out? So then they will be your judges. Now, what's going on here is that, you see, Jesus wasn't the only guy driving out demons in his lifetime. There were other people casting out demons at the time Jesus lived on the earth. There were well-known Jewish exorcists who would cast out demons. In fact, there's a school of thought in Jewish thinking that Solomon, years, hundreds of years earlier, that Solomon had learned the art of casting out demons, and that there is a school of Solomon in which they would be trained how to become exorcists. And they had some pretty unorthodox methods too. Like, uh, for instance, they would, make, they would make the possessed person smell things, and then they would cast out the demons through the nose. Wow. These are Jewish exorcists. And, and then others would even do this catch. This. They would bring um, boiling water into a cauldron brew of oil made from unripe olives, and then they would mix it together with the plant mysticia and the lotus pith, and they would boil it all with marjoram, and they would actually recite a, an incantation while this brew was boiling in a pot. They would actually re re recite an incantation to drive demons out of people. I mean, that, just, that is witchcraft. That's witchcraft. And so some, some maybe were very off track, and some were closer to doing it the godly way, but there were other people who were casting out demons in Jesus' time. And so Jesus, Jesus is saying, look, if you're calling me a, a demonic, then you're a hypocrite because your own people, people within your sect, are driving out demons. Let them be your judge. Are you calling me demonic? That, that's just ridiculous. And then verse 20 reads, but, and this is powerful, but if I drive out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Verse 20 is so powerful. Jesus says, if I'm right and you're wrong, then that means the kingdom of God is breaking out right here in your midst. And you, you are so dense, 
that you just can't pick up on it. Either that or you just refuse to believe. You're so stubborn and you're too stubborn to admit it. Finger of God. Maybe Jesus was talking about the time that Moses received the law upon the mountain and it says that the finger of God inscribed the letters of the law on the stone tablet. Or maybe Jesus is talking about the time that the occult magicians of Egypt were not able to trump Moses and Aaron with the mighty signs and wonders that were happening when they were delivered during the Exodus. And do you remember this? After the plague of the gnats, the magicians from Egypt, they said, we can't do what he's doing. This is the finger of God. I don't know which one Jesus was referring to. But this is, this is powerful. And then in verse 21 he says, When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own house, his possessions are safe. But when someone stronger attacks and overpowers him, he takes away the army in which the man trusted and divides up his plunder. Jesus is saying, when a house is secure, you can't overpower it by sneaking in the back way. You can't overcome by stealth. No, the only way to overpower a superpower is by brute force. What Jesus is saying is this, and th there's several points I want to give you in rapid succession. Here's the first one. God is more powerful than Satan. Amen. God is more powerful than Satan. The, the power of the enemy is impressive. But God is the superpower of the universe. God is the ultimate power. And that is really evidenced by this very next verse, verse 23. Whoever is not with me is against me. And whoever does not gather with me scatters. So he, he's saying just a plain and simple truth. First he says God is more powerful than Satan. And now he puts it to us plainly. For or against. Jesus says either you're for me or against me. Now listen to me. Luke really wants us to feel the pinch right here. Is Jesus who He said He is or not? Either, either He is Lord or He isn't. Yes or no. For or against. You see, that's the question that each one of us has to answer. And that is the reason that this text is the one we're looking at as we're closing out this series. That was then. This is now. Many of us in the room have made our choice. We have decided, you know what? I'm for Jesus. I'm not against Him. I'm Amen. for Him. And I will follow Him. Many of us have decided we believe Jesus. Did you know that many in this room, you have made a public de declaration of your faith. And some of you in this room have decided during this very teaching series, I'm going to follow Jesus. It's wonderful when everything is new. Have you forgotten? Have you forgotten what it was like when you first came to Jesus and accepted Him as your Savior and all of your sins were washed away and you just wanted to tell everybody it is wonderful when things are new. But anything that's new requires maintenance. And now, Jesus gives us an important teaching about Keeping that new Christian smell. He says, when an impure spirit comes out of a person, it goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. 
seeking rest but does not find it. Notice this, and it finishes the statement from earlier. The essence of evil is unrest. That is something really important. Let that sink into you. The essence of evil is unrest. The evil spirit roams through arid places looking for pl a place to rest, but it can't find any place to rest. When you start feeling unrest in your spirit, you are beginning to drift from the presence of God. When a nation experiences political unrest and social upheaval, as a, na a nation, we are beginning to slip from God. The evil spirit seeks for rest. It is in a state of unrest. The only rest, the only relaxation for an evil spirit is when it creates unrest in a victim. Verse 24, when an impure spirit comes out of a person, it goes through the arid places seeking rest. It does not find a person. The next part of the verse, then it says, then it says, catch this, I will return. I will return to the house I left. Important words. I will return to the house I left. Here's an important teaching point. Satan always tries something that worked before. If you have struggled with something in the past, the enemy would be foolish not to try to do it again. He will wait until you're weary and tired and, and in a time of weakness, he will pounce on you for all your worth and he, he will bring up every struggle from the past. I will return to the house I left. He will try something that worked before. Here, here's the thing. While I don't believe in generational curses, and I do not, and I know that some people do, but I, I do not believe in a strict sense that there are generational curses upon people because Jesus makes it very clear that the blind man did not suffer because he had sinned or because his parents had sinned but it was so that the glory of God could be revealed so it wasn't about that it wasn't about the parents or the son and in fact if you study the writings of Ezekiel Ezekiel made the statement that from grandfather to father to son, across the sweep of three generations, each one stands on their own merit. And so the son cannot blame the father, the father cannot blame the grandfather. But again, again, if anger worked with dad, why wouldn't he try that on me? If mom struggled with alcoholism, the devil would be a fool to not try that on me. He's always going to try something that has worked before. I will return to the house I left. Here's something, another important thing to know. It's not a matter of if, but when. Don't sit back on your heels wondering if the enemy will attack you. Don't just happily go through life thinking, well, I wonder if at some point he's going to be strategic and, and come against me. I'm tell I can promise you, I can guarantee you 100%. Yes, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And verse 25 confirms this. When it arrives, it's not a matter of if, but when. When it arrives... It finds the house swept clean. 
and put in order. Then it goes and takes seven others all in. The old is gone. The new is here. That was then. This is now. How do I keep it that way? You've got to be committed. No straddling the fence. Verse 27 says, As Jesus was saying these things, a woman in the crowd called out, Blessed is the mother who gave you birth and nursed you. And he replied, Blessed are those, rather, who hear the word of God and obey it. This mother in the crowd couldn't contain herself. Boy, she just, she yells out, Blessed are you! And boy, your mother is so blessed to have you for a son. And by the way, if we were supposed to pray to Mary, to the Virgin Mary, Jesus missed a wonderful opportunity to say so. He does not speak the honor to her, though we honor, we honor Mary. What a wonderful woman. She bore the Christ child. But we do not pray to her. We pray to our Lord. And, and here's the amazing thing about Jesus. This compliment comes his way, and he just deflects it. Just like always, he just he deflects it. And, and he says, yeah, yeah, it's, it's not about that. Here's what's important. You have to be the person who hears the word of God and obeys it. Amen. That's all. So, so don't try to connect me with, you know, with that he's blessed, he's the son of Mary. No. Just read the word, hear the word, obey the word. That's how you will be blessed. In other words, which side are you on? So that's what this whole teaching is about. Which side are you on? That's how you keep that new Christian smell. You stay on his side. You stay as close to him as you can. And the moment you begin to drift, you pull back and you stay close. At the Naval War College, there is a course known as Fundamentals of Command and Decision. The teacher was telling the students how important it is to make solid decisions when you're in the midst of great pressure. And that day, there was a visiting officer who was in the room. He was a foreign officer, part of a foreign navy. And he heard the teacher say that you've got to be willing to make tough decisions when you're under pressure. You've got to keep your mind straight and make the right choices. And he spoke up and said, boy, talk about making tough decisions. I was 700 miles out into the ocean in my destroyer when I received dispatch from my base. And they said, we have just had a revolution. Which side are you on? <laughs> Can you? Can you imagine? You're in charge of a destroyer. You're 700 miles away from home. And now you find out your homeland is having a revolution. And they want to know, by the way, which side are you on? Thankfully for us, we don't have such a hard decision as that. All we have to do is follow the Lord Jesus Christ with all of our hearts. And I guess that's the whole point of this this sermon today, as we're wrapping up this series of messages, that's the point of this teaching. What side are you on? I want to close with a provocative statement. And I've made a provocative statement each of the four weeks. And this one is probably one of the most provocative I could, could ever make. But I think you will remember it. It's this. Change your air freshener regularly. You know how, here's what I'm picturing. That new car smell. Did you know there is a 
Um, there's a, an air freshener that hangs from the, um, from the rear view mirror, and it's called the new car smell. I don't have one. I need to pick one of those up, the new car smell. That's kind of what I'm picturing. Now, I'll be honest with you. I, I thought about going a different direction with this message. I thought about saying change your deodorant regularly. <laughs> I didn't think that would quite go over and have the same impact. Listen, you need to, yeah, I got a big amen from some of you. <laughs> Don't tell your neighbor, change your deodorant. Okay, listen, change your air freshener regularly. Here's why, here's why I use those words. In the Bible, in both Hebrew, which is the language of the Old Testament, and Greek, which is the language of the New Testament, both languages have one word, in Hebrew, it's ruach. In uh, Greek, it's penuma. They both mean breath, air, wind, and spirit. And you have to define what word it mean, what the meaning of it is by the context around it. For instance, there's sometimes where clearly it is speaking of uh, the wind, like natural wind. And yet Jesus makes a play on wind as he's talking to Nicodemus at nighttime. The wind is blowing and Jesus makes the correlation to how it's equal to the Spirit of God blowing upon us. When when you're serving Jesus, when you're a follower of Christ, you've got to change your air freshener regularly. Change your wind freshener regularly. Change your breath freshener regularly. Change your spirit freshener regularly. Our ushers are going to give you a little gift to remember this today. Um, one to each household. I, I didn't realize quite how expensive they were. I thought, I'm not going to pay that much for yeah, but to give everybody one. But uh, the ushers are coming by, and you can choose green, you can choose blue, or you can choose red. One per household. If you've got a little bit bigger family, go ahead and take two. I think we have enough. But uh, one per each household. And here's, here's the thing. Whenever you use these little um, breath strips, I hope that you will remember this message. I hope that each time you put one of these 36, or I guess it's 24 breath strips in your mouth, the sensation that you feel, I hope that it's a reminder to you to change your air freshener regularly. That is, to be in, in tune with Almighty God regularly. To come back to Him and say, I want you to wash me and clean me, and I just want that new Christian smell again. I want to ask our band to come back and begin to play softly. This morning we get the chance to take communion. It's one of the most awesome privileges that we have. There's one of these in the chair.